Hi, my name is Theo, and you are listening to Between Two Trains. We bring you the best and brightest entrepreneurs in the North DeKalb area on the 1st and 15th of every month. Today, your co-hosts are Van Pappas and Eric Most. And now, Between Two Trains. Welcome back to another episode of Between Two Trains. I'm your host, Van Pappas, with Oxygen Financial. And sitting to my right is my ever-fabulous co-host, Eric Most, with Chase Bank. Eric, once again... Welcome back. Ever fabulous. Ever fabulous. The adjectives keep on growing. Yes, yes. Soon, glad to hear soon we're going to have to have a whole intro just for you. Glad to hear. I'm glad to be here. Um, and today we have a special guest. We have an entrepreneur who is in the legal profession, Mr. John Ernst of Ernst Legal. Uh, John, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm having a great day today. All right. So uh, Ernst Legal, law firm... It's located in the um, airport uh, complex, uh, one of the office buildings there in the airport. How yeah. long have you been there? I've been there now oh, close to six, seven years. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, 1954 Airport Road. It's that Globe building, the first building on the left-hand side over there at PDK. Uh, we're a, a law firm. Uh, it's myself and my wife, who's also an attorney. Uh, a, a family few, business. Yeah, I like it, it. It is a little family business. Um, and, uh, and a couple of assistants, but we handle... Uh, real estate closings, uh, bankruptcy, uh, personal injury. Uh, how I always uh, talk about it is my bankruptcy and my closings are kind of the yin and yang of the economy. So when one's down, the other one's up. And so that's... Nice. Uh, You're recession-proof. That, yes. That is my, that's my baseline. And then personal injury uh, pays for a lot of the fun and the, and the extracurriculars when the good cases come in. That's ubiquitous. Yeah. Whether the economy is good or bad, people are going to get hurt. Still need, still need a lawyer, right? Well, correct. There, there's always a lot of that. Um, you know, it's interesting that market is, is, is a, uh, becoming a very di- more difficult market. There's actually less injuries going on. Cars are safer than they were 10, 15 years ago. You have automatic braking that's happening. So you're having a lot, a lot of uh, le- le- less impact. And also, when the impacts occur, are a lot less injuries, which is a very good thing overall. But that has that reduced the number of lawyers that specialize in that? Because it seems like at one point, like in the '80s and early '90s, you, everywhere you turned around, there was some lawyer doing personal injury. Uh, it's it's the same number of people, and or you know, very similar. Um, it, the market is more spread out. Um, and you, most people know those attorneys by the advertising that you see. The, the, tel- of, the, 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 the television commercials the and commercials. the big billboards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, John Foy, the strong yeah, arm of the law. Correct. And those, maybe we shouldn't have said his comparison. You no, know, but, <laughs> it, you know, it's, um, you know, and that's all marketing. All those names, one call, one that all, strong arm, those are not owned by those attorneys. Those are, Really? They pay for those uh, monikers with a marketing company. Wow. Uh, that they pay a, a, a licensing agreement. So you'll go to different areas. If you drive or you know go down to Florida, you'll hear a one call that's all person. With someone else. With someone else. Or a strong arm with someone else. So it's almost like you have a territory with those monikers. Correct. And so that's interesting. Eric, did you know that? I, I did not I know, didn't know that. that. Yes. And I thought I knew everything about business. No, so that that um so that's you know, those uh you know, the numbers are what the numbers are. And so um, it's very interesting on the marketing side on personal injury. It, it, you have to spend about as much as the top uh, attorney does to break in the market uh, because if the, 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 the studies have shown that if you sp- whatever you spend in marketing, if you don't outbeat the top person, then in fact you're reinforcing the top person because they just see another attorney on, on the TV and they just think of what they think of. And, uh, and so you, you, they may be your ad, but then they think, oh, I need an attorney and think about the first one, the first guy that they know and, and, right. and, and hear more about. So uh, there's a lot of attorneys out there that will, you'll see that a whole bunch of ads come out of one person and then they'll go down in three or four months. That's a person trying to, to break in the market and, and to it. But it's a, that, that area of the law is very business um, savvy, very marketing based. And, you know, the numbers are great. It's very big numbers on it. Um, and can be very very successful, but it you you know, it takes a lot of money to break in. Mm. So, as a percentage of your business, the real estate, the bankruptcy, personal, I mean, how much is that? I, revenues are probably about neutral. Uh, personal injury makes more money per case by far. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Uh, I like the closings myself uh, the most. It fits into what we'll probably talk about later um, in terms of you know what else I do in my life. Um, but if you know, closings, I can move things around. Personal injury, you know, if I have a judge saying I have to be somewhere, I have to be there. Um, so you we, can, from a, you're talking about from a scheduling standpoint, scheduling, you have more freedom with the yes, with the uh, closings. closings. Yes, and 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 my you know my knowledge base in terms of all the different aspects of real estate have has been was there already. But you know, I, obviously, with my other job, you know, I can market myself in the. Um, as a lawyer in different ways that can, you know, I have a lot more knowledge base on what's going on in, in, around in this region. So your wife is part of the business. Um, does she specialize in one of those she, things yeah, or she does it all too? No, she's mainly um, bankruptcy. Uh, she'll handle the closing in terms of actually the signing ceremony. Um, but yeah, she's mainly uh, bankruptcy and, and brief writing uh, for, she does for, some attorneys hire her to, to brief write on things. She don't want to, uh, you know, she's a very, very good writer. So that's what she likes to do. So we should have had her on here. Yeah. Would she say she enjoys being a partner with you? Or what's well, that I, dynamic like? Because well, you see each other at night every night, and now you have to deal with each other. Well, she usually is at home. A lot of the stuff she deals with, she can deal with it at home. Uh, she'll be with home with the kids or, and such. And so it, we have it so that there's office at the at the home and when she meets has to meet clients she has to meet clients but so we actually she's in the office when she needs to be in the office so we don't see each other 24 it, 7 it makes for an okay yes uh, exactly it, it, it's working so far but you know so any plans for bringing on other uh attorneys or partners or anything uh, well like that? It, it just kind of depends you know if i get you know every, as every attorney out there is always searching for the big next whale um or should be and in terms of marketing and trying to get, and if we have a big increase in business, then, you know, I'll hire staff accordingly, but, you know, you have to be very mindful of scale and, you know, how much you want to do. Um, it's great to make a lot of money sometimes, but also there's the trade-offs of how much can you, you know, lifestyle uh, aspects of it. Uh, and so, you know, sure. You have young kids, right? Yep, I have two kids, two three kids, two. Uh, two boys, nine and seven. So great ages. Um, and so, you know, wanting to you, you just uh, lifestyle choices, you know, sure. mm -hmm. that, um, that everyone has to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So the one sort of, I guess, self in the room that we haven't mentioned is besides being a great lawyer and having a successful business right here in Shambly, you are also are the mayor of Brookhaven. Yes. Our, our Shambly's uh, neighbor, as, as uh, someone says, the, oh, yeah, Shambly, the center of the universe. And I said, of course it is. It's the suburb of uh, Brookhaven. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> uh, sometimes we have a co-host here named David Carter. You might know David, yeah. who's also a lawyer. He, he likes to use that center of the universe phrase a lot. Yeah. So um, we, we should have gotten David to come yeah. join us for this uh, he interview. Had, he would have had a quick response. What, what, um, what made you want to be the, the mayor of Brookhaven? I, I, you know, I grew up here uh, in Brookhaven. Uh, my parents you know, moved me when I was one and a half. They still live in the same house in Hampton Hall subdivision, which is right, you know, right there in Brookhaven at, um, at the time. It was just unincorporated to cab. The city uh, started off. It started off decently fine. Um, Were you in, at all involved with the incorporation of the city? I was not. So um, uh, I was just, you know, uh, I had done politics in the way past, but I had not been very politically active. Uh, beforehand, um, I uh, was the chair of the DeKalb Ethics Board, and when it was completely dissolved, all intents and purposes, and I was able to get a budget and actually have hearings and we had a conviction of a sitting county commissioner for the DeKalb Ethics Board for the first time in 18 or 20 years under my leadership. Um, that got that board got remade by a, a new constitutional thing, um, which then got challenged and it, it lost. So the, the current board is all intents and purposes defunct uh, due to legal wranglings. But we, um, you know, was able to do that. Um, and this, like I said, the city was doing okay, uh, doing some really good things. Had some a lot of things that they weren't doing so great. I thought um, I I could lend my ear, and, and I like I said, done enough in politics in the past to kind of know what's going on, and had a vision of what we would do, and were able to to accomplish those goals in the first year, and it's uh, you know first term. I mean, 
And so we're, you know, have some best paved streets. Our stormwater stuff has been inspected. We have passed a park bond that's now in implementation. So we're putting $40 million into our parks. Even before that, we were plowing money into our parks, redoing them. Uh, we, you know, our police is considered some of the best police force in all of the metro area. We're the safest, uh, safest city inside the perimeter. For uh, and so, and that's including, you know, Brookhaven has Buford Highway, and it has the has the majority of the residents of Buford Highway are in the Brookhaven aspect of it. Um, and so, even with that, we're still the safest city, and um, and that's a big testament to our police force. So. You know, taking care of the basics and, and doing some other things, you know, a little bit, it, testing things out here and there. So that's, you know, how I see uh, local government is you, you first care about the basics, get those right, and then you can you can do some other things. Let, let's talk, since you are you are an entrepreneur, and this is a show about entrepreneurs, but I want to talk a little bit, since we have you here, about how city governments and businesses really intera interact uh, you know, having started the Shambly Chamber of Commerce, I've talked with hundreds of different business owners, and sometimes they have really great things to say about their local municipalities, and sometimes they want to complain. Mm -hmm. So from your side, since you see both sides, you, you're a business owner and mm -hmm. uh, you're a politician, talk a little bit about, you know, what it's like, what the city has to go through when dealing with businesses because a well, business owner doesn't get to vote right yeah, well i mean now they don't get to vote and they may be you know a lot of our business owners are residents um here and, and and we do listen to you know being a mayor uh and in government it's you know people talk about you know why can't we just operate like government like a business and it's not it's a separate it's government is not a business um it is a it, it is a uh side construct um because a business's job is to is to raise revenues and make money. You don't want your government just to raise revenues for the sake of raising revenues. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, one of the biggest issues you have is I'm the government is one of the few times or few groups of uh, or organizations in one's life that tell someone no. You know, I have a lot of highly successful business people, CEOs of very big companies. Um, makes lots of money and for their entire life if you think about it are never told no can I have this sure we can do whatever you know need I need this okay well business government has to treat everyone equally and and so there's things like oh I don't like that my that my you know us you know I don't want a sidewalk or a lot of people say it's, I want a sidewalk I just want on the other side of the street and I have to or the government has to say no I'm sorry we're gonna put a sidewalk here and there's, and really, there's not much you can do about it. This, this was the plan. This is what we're doing. So, for some people, it's uh, get very put off by having to be told no or hey, that's just how it works. Um, as you know, man, you know, there's uh, governments. There's there's a lot of different rules. We have to again treat everyone equally. There's laws. Um, there's you know charters. There's reasons. Um, both federal, state, and local reasons why things can't be done the way people think they should be done, and it's my job to navigate to that to that point, um, because a lot of times people want I'll just call it X, whatever X is, and and a lot of the political arguments are always about how to get to X. Why you know why can't you know I want to go A, B, and C, and someone says I want E, D, and F, and my job is is to try to take everyone's perspective and go okay everyone wants X. The way I see X from what the knowledge that I've been given and the, detail, the laws I've been told and the stuff to get to X, I have to go this path. Now, and we'll get to X. So you do that and people on either side go, oh my God, that's not exactly how I wanted it done. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, I'm getting you X and I understand how you do it and I understand there may be some, you know, something that happened in the past that you thought was wrong. Um, but that's being taken care of by this other measure, or you're scared about some future, uh, you know, uh, uh, slippery slope type aspect. But I'm like, you want X, so here's X. Um, and so I have that conversation a lot. But for businesses, obviously, you know, you know, a lot of people like myself, why do I have to go into a, into a, 
a, a building and pay a small nominal fee to get a thing that says I can have a business. I mean, the, most people are like, that shouldn't be the case. A business license. Yeah, business license. Right. Yeah, why do I have to have a business license? Right. Which, well, you do. And and people get pissy that they have to get a business license. Or um, there are people get mad because, you know, they buy a building and, you know, the life safety stuff is not in the building. It's an older building. You have it's to not rehab, up to code. Not up to code. So you have to rehab that. And that is a pretty penny. And that's government telling them someone, you just have to drop $100,000 they didn't expect to uh, on a building and you know, and such, uh, or um, you build a new building and you get upset that you uh, uh, for stormwater. You know, I have to take care of one's own. If someone has to take care of their own stormwater, and because of that, um, they have to spend extra money. Yeah. And they said, "Why do I have to do that? Why can't it just be fixed?" Well, it's part of the larger plan to get to X for stormwater. It's so that we have less flooding, uh, you know, more usable land, uh, better nature. Uh, uh, to uh, energize our aquifers for later um, droughts that could ha happen in the future. So, you know, there's all part of the bigger plan, but for an individual person, they have to spend the money or being told, no, they can't do it that way. And people get, you know, people don't like to be told no. Yeah. Is it, in, is it intimidating uh, to some degree dealing with the wide spectrum of types of individuals with the di different levels of wealth that you see and perhaps, you know, I don't know if intimidating is necessarily the word. It just, you have to kind of understand everyone's perspectives and try to get as quick as you do to their perspectives. Because, like I said, almost 85 to 90% of the people want the exact same thing. They want X, whatever X is. But they have a different perspective on it. And, and, and a lot of times people in these days use it, a Republican Democrat thing. And, I say this all the time, you know, I, I have a political party, I prefer like everyone else in the world, but a pothole is not a Democratic pothole or a Republican pothole, it's just a pothole, you just fix it. But people... Well try, said, well yeah, said. Exactly. So people always have to try to, when they talk politics, or feel like they have to talk into this their spectrum of the political belief. And it's like, stop guys, we just want X, we want the pothole filled, so yeah. let's, let's just do that. Um, and so that, and so then you have that, and then you have, you know, the the perspective of people don't want to pay taxes and and I everyone doesn't want to pay taxes um, and but they say well I want again I want X I want parks I want new better parks well okay I can get you better parks you know here's what's gonna cost mm -hmm. you know we'll put out the vote oh my god that's a lot of money and it's like well a is it because you know when our 40 million dollar park bond the average uh, uh, homeowner was an extra hundred, less than hundred dollars a year, for, for a park bond that would raise their property values, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot. But people don't want to spend money, or they think they're older, they're like hey, it's not going to be useful to me or all that stuff. That's fine, perfectly understandable. But there's other people who say, oh, I want parks, but I want to pay for it. And and I'm like, you have the government you have now with the taxes you pay now, on at least on the local and state level. Federal is a separate matter because they can deficit spend. If you want any new services or any new capital projects, you have to pay for them. It's very simple. So this is what they cost. You could people say, well, that costs too much. Well, first of all, tell me how I can, you know it's competitively bid. Please bid on it for cheaper if you want to make the money. I'm fine with that. Um, you have to be qualified, but folks go out and do that. Um, mm -hmm. And it is just the you know the nature of our our, our systems and the laws that we have. So I, I could go on and expand on that a little bit too, but. Well, I want to talk a little bit about what um, you feel uh, government should do to try to attract businesses to the area. You know, both you and I have lived in the North Cab area our whole lives mm -hmm. pretty much. And, you know, we, you probably remember what, Brookhaven and Shambly used to be like in in the 80s it was very different than today as as our society in Atlanta has gone from Buckhead into Brookhaven and now into Shambly and it's grown you know the areas have gotten more expensive what should government really be doing if anything and maybe they shouldn't be doing anything to try to attract businesses to come to the area well the government is not um, as people you know uh, the government is not a scalpel. Um, 
it is a sledgehammer. So anything that the government does has to try to do equally for the most part. And so that creates, you know, people say we don't want government involvement, but then I want government to do X, Y, and Z. I want to bring, you know, either business or I want to t take care of affordable housing. Well, you can do that, but that costs money or, or, or other stuff. But in terms of bringing in business, it's a, that is a, that is a spectrum on, you know, kind of the values of the, of the city and what you want. You know, there's some out there that, you know, think that you only should try to uh, attract the highest, you know, corporations, the big, uh, the big, um, uh, the fortune 500, fortune 500, like Sandy Springs things. seems to be doing well. And they, and they have a, they have an area for that. And, um, but they, you know, they attract that. That's what economic development is. There's others that say, why can't you help the mom and pop shops um, yes. and, and, and such? Um, and, and you do, being one of those, well, yeah, I, I would like to be able to do, to be able to help those kind of uh, businesses in a way. Um, but when you get into that, you can't pick and choose which business it has, you know, it kind of has to be, um, uh, you know, kind of universal and the, you know, the, the big corporations, the tax abatement laws are set up so that it, it's only really for those big things because you have to bring economic activity. Well, if the mom pops already there. There's no new ec economic activity. Yeah. Henceforth, there's no justification to it to do a uh, tax abatement on the property if someone were actually to challenge it. So you have all these other things, and then if one person gets it, what about the other company or yeah. the other company? So it's it's this dichotomy. Um, but there's other things you can do. There's, you know, marketing, you can help, you know, we, we help the, the Brookhaven Chamber. Uh, we're trying to set up the Restaurant Association uh, in, in a Brookhaven Restaurant Association. We're, we're thinking about some ideas with Uber and Lyft and, um, and with the Restaurant Association to just bring more business. Um, so... But there's, you know, other things. You know, I love a brewery here in Brookhaven. I know Shanley has two going on. I would I would lo absolutely love a distillery. There's, there's not one in the northern um, metro Atlanta area or the north DeKalb area myself right now. Uh, but, you know, Brookhaven's has a lot of high rent areas. That's the problem why we don't have a brewery. You mentioned a second ago, I don't mean to interrupt this yeah. train of thought, but you mentioned a second ago about affordable housing and we're coming up on our break. So I just want to briefly talk about your feelings of affordable housing and how that plays in, not necessarily just to Brookhaven, but in general, how concerned should our North DeKalb area be about the fact that Let's be honest, the valuations are going up and it's becoming harder and harder for people of lower means to live here. I, I, see, I, I read, when we talk affordable housing, I, I talk about it you know, throughout the region. I try to talk about it not just on the lower end because if everyone talks affordable housing, everyone thinks Section 8, lower end, all that stuff, which is a problem. Don't get me wrong. But we have a problem in Brookhaven at least. You know, we don't have a middle area. I could not afford, you know, the house that I have right now, I could not afford. I, if I was from the outside and I, you know, um, I, if I hadn't built right during the recession uh, and, and, and such, I would not be able to afford, I couldn't pay for the house that I have right now. Yeah. Um, so it's Brookhaven, I think, on a single family detached residency, I think we've had one in the last house in the last three years that have sold for under 825 again there might be some more but it's very minimal so we have mass we have new houses that are very high rights we have townhomes that are in the you know, we have some million dollar townhomes and we have six to seven hundred thousand dollar townhomes we have nothing else we've yeah. we've lost that all. that's the challenge isn't that, it? that's the challenge that's you know a tear down is 400 350 400 thousand so we don't have anything for people to start in Brookhaven. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened with Shambly. In fact, I think Shambly's already gone that way. That's why everyone's moving their first house is Doraville. Right. Um, and Doraville's starting to get hot. Um, so how do you build places for people to live uh, on all different income scales? Because you want to have a mix. Because if you just have million-dollar houses, um, there's only a market for so much. And you, you want to have a nice 
base to protect every to, to protect everyone. So it's not just low end. I'm yeah, no, I think you're right about that. I, I appreciate how you're saying that because that's what I think sometimes politicians don't say. You said it great because I think the average person, you're right, thinks about affordable housing as that really low income, crappy housing that you know is for people who have absolutely nothing. But when I think, just like you, about affordable housing, I think about who's going to work in my shops, in the businesses that are making fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. Who they're not poor, but they're also not making enough to afford, like you said, the house that you're currently living in. Well, and and the medium income of this country is sixty thousand dollars. I just was watching CNBC, and that's you know that was thrown out again. I, um, and, you know, what in Brookhaven could someone buy at $60,000? And the answer yeah. is nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a shame because that's where wealth, you know, generational wealth gathering has, it occurs. It's always been in housing prices. And you can talk about, uh, you know, the red line areas and all that other stuff um, uh, with African-American experience. Um, and that's why they haven't had the wealth gains that the... the, the the other immigrant populations of our of our country have had um, because of those systematic uh, problems, um, but you know I think those have gone away as a long term. So how do you get people in? So so going back, if they, sixty thousand dollars can't live in Brookhaven, but they want to work in Brookhaven or Shambly or right around here, there those employing bases they have to live far out. Yeah. Well, they have now to you live, got a transportation problem. And then you have a transportation problem because we're having what you know what I call the the, the uh, impending uh, physics doom of transportation, i.e., we cannot, uh, we pay for transportation, we cannot keep people on cars, single use cars, traveling one tr from A to B. That is physically, physics is going to take control there yeah. and say it's impossible. So, um, uh, so you have a transport, you have a transportation traffic problem that's caused by people having to move in these uh, further and further out to afford stuff. So you have to have that mix so that people will can live here, work in and around here, and you don't have the transportation traffic problems. That's where the Brookhaven Marta stop really is an asset for the community. Oh, well, make, yeah, the, the, the bar, the, we are. Shandling. Let's talk about that after because we're up at uh, our wall the for clock. the break. Yeah, <laughs> we got to <laughs> We got we got to uh, take our short break where we uh, hear from our wonderful sponsor sponsor here at thirty four eleven co working, and we'll be right back to continue this conversation with business owner, entrepreneur, and mayor John Ernst. Looking for an affordable, functional, and creative space to work? Check out thirty four eleven co working in downtown Shambly. They have flexible month-to-month -month office space options that include fiber internet, meeting rooms, printing, coffee, snacks, and networking events. 3411 Coworking is the perfect place for entrepreneurs, remote workers, and small business owners looking for a one-stop shop for your professional needs. Stop by for a tour Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 and see how 3411 Coworking can work for you. Welcome back to Between Two Trains. You can hear us on the 1st and the 15th of every month. Today we're talking with entrepreneur, business owner, mayor, John Ernst. And um, we are at our hot or not section. So Eric, take it away. So something that all our listeners can uh, probably agree with, that traffic in Atlanta is not hot. So let's just go <laughs> ahead and uh, jump right in about traffic. I mentioned for both Shambly, Doraville, and Brookhaven, communities we've all talked about, MARTA is a huge asset. Mm -hmm. um, Atlanta is trying to build their way out of the traffic issue with 75 express lanes, 85 express lanes. There's stuff going on with 285. But for the communities in between, let's talk about that. Okay. Well, no, I, um, you know, is the hot or not, uh, Marta no, stations? I, I already, already answered the okay. question. Traffic is not hot. Traffic, traffic is, is not, not hot. hot. Okay. So how do Can we, we all three agree? Yeah, traffic, traffic is, is not, not hot. hot. So how do we, so, so I can go on lots of details on this. So I'm, I'm the chair of the six mayors, the top end mayors. So from Smyrna, Brave Stadium to Doraville and including Tucker uh, to talk about trains along the top end. Um, and we uh, looked at that itself. Um, so I've done, I've been doing that and I'll go into details there. I'm also on the DeKalb stakeholders for the transportation plan that was just released for, uh, for um, DeKalb County. 
So basically what I was saying before, we're running into a physics problem. Physically, we cannot um, continue to use single family cars in infinitum to move our people to the stuff. You can't, um, you have to have some transportation options. You have to have transportation options that are reliable, that people you will use on all income brackets. Um, for those to be feasible, you have to have, you almost have to have density because people will then use it. Um, and that is, but of course, a lot of folks don't want density. They want to have exactly the way it is now. But usually the statement is, oh, you're bringing in more density. That means more traffic. Correct. And, the, and, and that could be the case. But if it's built along TODs, the, the traffic impact of that extra density is, is mitigated. There's still... Just for our listeners, a TOD is... A... Transit-oriented development. Thank you. Um, and so I've looked at this thing all along. Uh, Atlanta, I think it's changing. Atlanta has had um, this, this mindset of basically that MARTA got its penny 40 years ago. It built heavy rail and built a bus system, all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. um, the heavy rail is very limited to where it goes. Um, anytime I can use the heavy rail, I do. I go to Braves games. I'm sorry, not Braves games. I go to Land United games. I go to Hawks games. I'm seizing it with both. I go to the airport. If I have a meeting down in Midtown, I'll take MARTA any, every time. Because I know once the doors close, I'm going to get to a certain point at a certain time, no matter what. I don't have to worry about traffic and such. But as most people say is, well, MARTA doesn't go everywhere. I don't, I don't need to go Midtown or wherever. I need to go yeah. to next one. Or, or like you mentioned, the Braves. The you Braves. can't go to the Braves, the Braves right, right now. And so that's actually what happened is everyone had talked about, you know, I was sitting there and I was like, everyone's talking about you know, transportation to east to west to get to the Bra or get to the Bray Stadium, and I go, interesting, huh? The you know the closest Marta station to the Bray Stadium is either Medical Center or Dunwoody. It's not this you know Art Center, which is down in Midtown, yeah. which everyone had always assumed would be the connection. It's 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 closer to where we are. So us mayors can come get in, let's everyone get in a room that's three counties has never been done before cross trend jurisdictional, that much coming together and say, okay, how do we put transit? Everyone says, well, we want heavy rail or light rail or let us you, you know, I think very quickly, uh, light rail was, let's, we would take, investigate that. Um, but we also said, because they're building the top end 285, revived 285, the managed lanes, you know, this is the time to get that transit corridor. It turns out, you know, that was in the initial revive 285 to do a transit corridor. There was no big sponsor for it. No one championed it. Uh, to go now, it's an extra billion and a half dollars just to get the 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 uh, right of way right. to get the light rail. Um, and then heavy rail costs four, uh, $450 million a mile. Light rail costs $250 million a mile. And a what is called BRT, which is something that Atlanta area does not have, does not know it has, it does have it, I'll explain in a second, uh, is an option that's cost $25 million a mile. And so we all, the mayor sat around and said, hold that's on, a no -brainer. this is a no-brainer. GDOT spending the $4 million, $4.5 million, $4.5 billion for these managed lanes, why don't we ride off of these managed lanes and put transit stations on, uh, that they're on own dedicated on offs, uh, put it around, get to the Braves, get to Dorville, uh, have flyover bridges where ne needed and such. The right of way is not as much. Uh, and you're t talking about half, half uh, $500 million. That's literally one mile of heavy rail. We could build this entire system. Well, once we did that, I took that to the DeKalb plan and the, everyone in DeKalb started seeing that. So they're talking about being doing uh, bus rapid transit down uh, the east wall of 285 and all th kind of throughout, and I've been pushing that. And that goes into the X issue. Everyone in, in Atlanta says, oh, I want transit. and But everyone who wants transit will start arguing about modes. No, it has to be light rail. It has to be heavy rail. And the cost is too much. And so we all argue amongst each other. The people that don't want it just sit back and do nothing. And in the end, we get nothing. So 
having that transportation and so BRT going back to BRT it's bus rapid transit it's a horrendously named engineered name for a for a transit system what it what it actually is it's a train on wheels it looks like a train it feels like a train it just is on wheels and instead of laying down track and having balancing and all that other stuff it's on it's a regular just, road it's just on a regular road but to be truly effective it needs to have its own dedicated lane or dedicated pathway, just like a train does. Are these smaller? So they're not like the the MARTA trains. I mean, they'll have five, six, seven cars. No, they, these these would, will have smaller. They, they they would probably have smaller. But that's the great thing about it is they're ultimately flexible and ultimately scalable. So yeah. if you have a rail line, if you have a line that is really working and it's having people, you just add another bus. You add gotcha. another bus, and when it's all said and done, those buses are more likely going to be automated. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. With, with the autonomous vehicles and Correct. whatnot, this is just a natural progression. Correct. El electric? In, in, yes, more naturally it would be electric. Now, there are electric ones that do it right now. You know, you could go either way. But, yes, I would think in the time frame it would take to, to do it, you, you would be electric. So you have these dedicated pathways, for lack of a better term, that transit goes on. And these toes, you know, train on wheels or tots, uh, trains on tires – or uh, what I've called tram transit um, can go on these dedicated rails. So people say, well, I don't want to ride a bus. And there's actually a BRT system in Atlanta right now that everyone rides and everyone thinks is a train, but in fact is not a train. So the, the plane train at the airport is not a train. It is a BRT system. Yeah. And so one could think... You know, most people out there listening to this and everyone out there has ridden that train. That, that tram. Yeah. That tram. From the T gates to back and good right, cut. Right. And so they understand. So, so that's the system y'all are really talking about. That's, that's a system that could look like a train, feel like a train, have the quality of a train on a dedicated thing. And the managed lanes, it wouldn't be dedicated, but the managed lanes are, are, are guaranteed by pricing to stay at 45 miles an hour. We also could use a shoulder for emergency purposes. I talked to GDOT about. So you could build this entire transit system using BRTs um, or tram transit or, or uh, whatever you want to call it throughout, and you could connect people and go to different places. So um, we have one on the top end in, in, along for Shambly, Doraville, Brookhaven area, along from Lindbergh up Buford Highway to the Doraville station, having a dedicated little train right or tram right there going to the new Emory campus to the um, to uh, the uh, new Choa building, the 1.5 billion dollar Choa building that mm -hmm. you know my economic development I helped bring in. I'm going up Buford Highway, which by the way is the number one bus line of all of the entire market Buf system. The Buford Highway was. The yeah, Buford, people don't know that. Yeah, 30, the 39 is the highest used, most used bus line in entire Marta. It's only not only that it has two separate private companies that go down Buford Highway and they make money. Right uh, on on top of the Marta on top of the Marta, which is their number one line to begin with. Yeah. So it's so, and right now Buford Highway. If you would say what's the least clogged road in, in the entire area, yeah. everyone would say it would be Buford Highway. It literally is the one that has the most people on it. Yeah, and so sometimes they're almost going too fast down there. I know G Dot is trying to slow those cars down correct. because. You know, there are sections where you can just fly down Buford Highway. Correct. And it's, but so you can, so, you know, people, so to go back to your point about, you know, density versus traffic, if it's done right and you have the amenities there and you have the stuff and you have the connections in transit to get people to go where they go, then you don't have the traffic. And so it's, it's a, it's a holistic approach. Now, do I think you need to build the highest density everywhere and, and just connect up? No. I mean, it's a process of trying to get those things in there and allow for the development. So um, the traffic, I think if we could get Atlanta folks could get off of what mode we have to use, we have to use rail. Um, I, I would contend if Atlanta, city of Atlanta changed the belt line from a light rail to a tram transit right now, they could do build it in three years, it'd be done. They could have transportation instantaneously. Um, but there's these folks that are very, and I love them, you know, they're, they want transit and they think that it's rail or die. And if it's not rail, it's not transit. And that's just not the case. Technology has changed, the, the things have changed, and 
it is ultimate, like I said, ultimately scalable. Because not only do you have a dedicated lane, if you have these dedicated lanes, you have the, 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 those lines, those BRT lines going through, the tram transit lines going through. Well, a local bus could you have entry points that they could go on that. So they right. come in and connect in, connect into the stations. Right. So you can have you just they could feed into the stations. Feed into instead. the stations. Yeah. Feed into feed into that network. So that network gets more and more capacity, um, and and you just and the, the amount of money is just so much less. And you could have a whole system system wide built out where you can really go uh, where you need to go, where you want to go. Yeah. Well, I think we could probably talk a whole episode just on transportation. I think we've taken up all our hot or not time. <laughs> it's on a this hot one. topic. It is hot a hot topic. topic. Yes, I, I apologize, but uh, you no, know, this is good information. I think it's good that you got that out so that the people can hear it because I think that's part of the problem is that there hasn't been a lot of good communication around this. So I encourage you to continue doing that during this. You you are up for re-election. I'm right? up for re-election, and so. you know, in you know. Um, so far, no one's has put in their uh, their word, and that could change. And uh, you know, I'm ready for a campaign if need be. Um, and you know, I let the citizens decide what they want done. Um, so, but you know, it, it, people, we I think people talk about transit, but they talk about it in such a ways that just to create the fights uh, and 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 such. And if you just sat down and said, how do we build a system out? We everyone could come to an agreement. Uh, very quickly, and and we could we could build a, a very top of line system very quickly. Quick question: Hot or not? Is it is? Would your wife say it's hot to be married to the mayor? I would. Um, I I don't think my uh, uh, wife would ever say it's hot to be married to. But your, <laughs> but, but your business partner would say it's yes, hot to exactly. Be married. No, no. Well, let's give a plug to the business before we yes. go. Yes. If someone needs your legal services, yes. Um, well, how do you want them to contact you? If, uh, contact me. I'll give my cell phone out. It's four zero four six six four eight six nine four. My landline six seven eight three nine two three eight six zero. Again, four zero four six six four eight six nine four. Six seven eight three nine two three eight six zero. Folks out there that are buying and selling a house, um, love you know. If you want me to handle your closing, make sure that you get the property and, and everything's handled correctly. Please let me know, especially those investors out there, uh, especially those uh, first time home buyers. Uh, you are able to select your attorney. Um, most of the time, the agents or the mortgage brokers select or try to push you, but you can have your own. We'll be willing to work with you to to complete your transaction. I, lo I love it. He, he gave out his personal cell number. That's the first time. I, I, you know, you don't, a lot of politicians won't do that. They're, they're scared of doing that. And John, you're not scared of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate that and respect that uh, as both a fellow business owner and uh, someone who really uh, appreciates what you've done in the city of Brookhaven. So we are out of time. Eric, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. In two weeks, we got a really special alternative show that we're going to do. Because we are here at election time for local municipalities, we are going to have, uh, specifically for Chambly, because uh, that's what we're geared towards, we are going to have all the contestants for Shambly local council member offices come on to the show. They're each going to talk to us about uh, them being a politician in Shambly and their views about businesses in Shambly. So stay tuned in two weeks for another great episode of Between Two Chains. I'll have to listen to that one. Yeah, it should be a it good has, one. It Thank should you. be very good. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> it's very, Shambly's politics is very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <I'll say that. laughs> Thanks for listening.